Welcome everybody uh, to tonight's program, Drawing the Arctic with Michael Boardman. My name is Monica Shear and I'm the Director of Outreach at Alaska Wilderness League. And I'm so thrilled to have you here for the third Geography of Hope series. Uh, and as we get started, I'm gonna do a few quick housekeeping uh, items, share some Zoom tips and tricks and get us started for the program tonight. Uh, in addition to tonight's program, I did just want to remind folks we have uh, three more upcoming. We have one this Saturday with Debbie Miller, which will be taking us to Prince William Sound. We have one the following Saturday, May 30th. Uh, it's a film called The Wild about Bristol Bay with filmmaker Mark Titus. And then the following Tuesday on June 2nd, we'll be exploring the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic Refuge with David Thorsten. More information uh, at the end, but just wanted to make sure that folks put those on their calendar as well. So I will be moderating today's session. And again, just so happy to see so many of you and so many familiar names. Uh, we are going to be providing a question and answer session at the end of Michael's presentation. At any point during the program today, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Uh, my colleague Lois Norgard will be monitoring, helping to answer any questions you might have, and then we will be Happy to field them at the end uh, with Michael. If you would like to see the speaker bigger, the picture, you can go to the upper right hand side and select speaker view for your viewing pleasure. And that way you'll be able to see uh, those of us that are talking a little bit larger. Gallery view shows you all of the participants. And following the program tonight, we will be sending out an email in the coming days that will have a recording of the whole program so you can watch and listen again at your earliest convenience. We will also be providing any links that we share tonight in that email so that you can see Michael's work. You can see other references that we might be sharing in the chat and you will have all of that in your email box. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Adam Colton, the Executive Director here at Alaska Wilderness League to start off our show. Thanks, Monica, and it's wonderful to see so, so many familiar faces and some new faces. Thanks for joining us for this third in our Geography of Hope series. Um, I'm speaking to you from my home in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, the, it was the traditional lands of the Lenape and Piscataway peoples and many other peoples over thousands of of years before settlers came to this area. But as you can see from my, my Zoom background, um, I'm kind of mentally transporting myself where the area we're, we're, uh, we're speaking about, uh, which is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge Coastal Plain. And you can see the Brooks Range behind me. You know, why I mentioned I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and um, fortunately not able to get to, to Alaska the way I want to right now and, and spend time in the wilderness, but I have been trying to to get to many of our local trails and hike along the Potomac River and the CNO Canal and some really terrific places. And I think in some of those outings, I'm 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 certainly feeling a little bit of solace and escape and rejuvenation and frankly some hope as I as I have that connectivity to nature. And sometimes it's just being alone, with my own thoughts. Sometimes it's uh, seeing. Uh, uh, some egrets or, or something that, that inspires me and, and, uh, and gives me hope. And so we, if those of you that turned into the, the last couple of our series, you know, we, we, we heard from some incredible adventurers, uh, Kristen Gates and the, the, the film she did, The Sacred Place Where Life Begins. We heard about the Gwich'in people. Um, we, we, had some great, great stories and inspiration. Then we heard about Carolyn Van Hemer, uh, author who wrote a, a book about her 4,000 mile journey in Alaska wilderness. And, and it was a great feat of adventure. Uh, so we got glimpses of the migration of the porcupine caribou herd and other caribou herds in Alaska. Uh, we, we heard stories about grizzlies and wolves and other wildlife. Tonight we're gonna have a special treat with, um, a tremendous artist and someone who has uh, also spent a lot of time at a bird camp that the Fish and Wildlife Service had along the Canning River Delta. 
And that's also inspirational, you know, and thinking about uh, the migratory birds, 200 species of birds that travel to or through every state and five continents on their way to the Arctic National Life Refuge where they nest or stage feed. Um, this cycle life is wondrous and also hopeful and inspirational at a time like this. So it's a special treat. We're real excited about the program. We're excited about this kind of sense of special community that's reinforced by all of us being together. Grateful for you being here with us. Um, we'll have more to say about the uh, ways to engage with the league as we go. But um, just one more word about how timely all this is. You know, of course, many of you are involved with Alaska Wilderness League uh, because we're your voice for Alaska's wilderness. We're working 24 seven to advocate for Alaska's wild places. And even amidst the COVID-19 crisis, and even while the, the attention of policymakers should be focused elsewhere, we're still unfortunately seeing efforts to advance drilling in places like the Arctic Wildlife Refuge and the Western Arctic that we spoke about a little bit during one of our earlier sessions. And this past week in particular, we saw the Secretary of Energy make some really deplorable comments. You know, he was, um, he compared uh, the effort of many of the banks that we've been, been urging and working with, and now more than a dozen major banks that have said they're not willing to finance any oil drilling activity in the Arctic Refuge. Uh, he said that's, he made an analogy, that's like redlining, you know, the, the past racist and discriminatory practices that prevented folks um, in underserved communities from, from getting mortgages and loans. He said somehow we shouldn't be redlining our oil and gas industry. I think, um, you know, it's an unfortunate comment and, 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 and really represents the wrong direction. and and not the hopeful direction that we want to get in the headspace for tonight, but what's been really heartening is to see the backlash. Um, just this past week, many of you and thousands of others have been putting pressure on the last major of the U.S. banks, Bank of America, that has yet to step up and say that they won't finance any leasing in the Arctic Refuge. So far from being deterred by this opposition, thousands and thousands are putting pressure on Bank of America, and we're going to talk about that more in the program. But again, with that, just huge thank you for being here with us. Thank you to Monica for kicking us off for the rest of the league team. Uh, I see our good friend Kay Henry on from Maine, so I hopefully some other Maine folks joining uh, who are with us as well and uh, can kind of hear from our Maine based artists who spent time in Alaska. But with that, let me turn, turn it back to Monica. Thank you so much, Adam. And yeah, without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael Boardman, longtime friend of the league, amazing artist um, who has gotten to spend some time in some of our amazing wildlife refuges and most recently this past summer in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge at the Canning River Bird Camp. Um, so Michael, please take us to the Canning River. <laughs> I'm going to talk about all 200 birds that migrate up to the Canning River one at a time. So get ready, it's gonna be really exciting. I won't torture you with that, but uh, I'm gonna start my presentation now. There I am. Um, getting to be artists and residents in Arctic National oh, Wildlife Refuge. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Oh. sorry, we're not seeing your screen yet. So one that you might. Uh, all right, yeah. Right, yeah, hold on. <laughs> I forgot to share it. <laughs> there we go. And there we go. Is that better? Perfect. Have you got Thank it? Thank you. All right, cool. So getting to be artists residents in Arctic National Wildlife Refuge was the fulfillment of a long time dream. I had to be able to visit the refuge. And um, of course, I'd, as a wildlife artist based in North Yarmouth, Maine, it's, it's a place that I've always wanted to explore. 
Um, I never really had an idea of how I would pull that off necessarily. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do a number of artist residencies, um, starting at a couple of cool ones in Maine, including Acadia National Park. And then in 2015, I was able to go to Glacier Bay National Park um, and be their artist in residence. Um, and that had special significance, and that's in Alaska. Um, special significance because that's where I asked my wife to marry me over 20 some odd years ago um, on a solo kayaking trip. Um, so these these experiences kind of built up to being able to go to the refuge. Um, always been drawn to creatures of the north, creatures of the Arctic who come down and visit us in the winters or pass through in the summers. Um, we're lucky enough in Maine, along the coast of Maine where I am, that we get a fairly uh, large influx of snowy owls. So I always imagined where they go and, and, and how they get there. Um, great spot. So. If people don't know, an artist, artist residencies are a way for um, public lands, parks, uh, refuges to honor the role of artists and writers they had in their creation. Um, for the park or the refuge, they get to see how their work um, and environment is interpreted through an artist's eye. And for an artist, it's a way to break out of your routine and be ensconced in pure inspiration. Um, the, Residency I did for Arctic was part of the Voices of the Wilderness Residency Program, which covers uh, 10 to 12 different wilderness areas of Alaska. And they each, each year they pair an artist, a writer, or a musician with one of these wilderness areas. And you go out on expedition with the rangers or the biologists to see what's going on and interpret the wilderness through their eyes. It's a fantastic program. It will be one of the links in the, uh, the link thing they send out. But I wanted to put a special shout out um, to Olas Muri, Olas and Marty Muri, who are great heroes of mine, who helped in the establishment of the refuge. Um, and this great quote they have about the inspiration that wild country has on us. Where was I? Um, I didn't, I figure most people on this Zoom are probably familiar with where Arctic National Life Refuge is. If you look at a map of Alaska, go all the way to the top and east, and it's right there bordering Canada. Um, this little hand-drawn map of mine kind of shows where we were on the Canning River, which is part of the 1002 area. The Canning River makes up the western edge of the refuge. And the bird camp is along one of the fingers of the Canning River Delta. Um, and it's an extremely wet spot. And that's where a lot of birds like that wet area to, uh, to raise their young. And it's an awesome thrill to get there from Fairbanks in a small plane flying 300 miles through the Brooks Range, opening up into the delta of the Arctic Plain and the wide expanse of the Canning River with the, all the river um, tributaries running through. And I could talk about it for a while, but to tell you the truth, I'm lucky enough that there's a video that the Fish and Wildlife Service put together that walks you through exactly what I went through and it's so much better than my words so I'm just going to run through it now. Whoops. Hold on for a sec. I'm going to go back. I messed that up. Sorry, we'll start that again.
So the refuge is a, just an incredible expanse of, of wilderness, 19 million acres. It's nearly the size of the state of Maine. Um, and it holds a full range of Arctic and sub subarctic ecosystems, undisturbed and functioning as they have for centuries. Um, it also has the greatest wildlife diversity of any protected area in the circumpolar north. Um, and it recognized as one of the last finest examples of wilderness on the planet. And if you can find a cooler place to camp for a week and a half, um, <laughs> I, I welcome you to try. The uh, Canning River Delta was just incredibly beautiful. That's our campsite with the uh, um, tented, our, our tents on the right-hand side and then the weather port and science station on the left. Um, the Arctic was just pure inspiration from the moment I landed there. Um, it's a place that's locked up in ice and cold for nine months of the year. Life needs to squeeze out the activities of spring, summer, and fall into those remaining three months. So it's an intense frenzy of activity. Um, a focused explosion of life that makes the coastal plain a prime place for many birds to breed and fledge chicks. Um, it's got fast growing plants. They don't have a lot of time to the dally around, they got to pop right out of the ground and start working. Some of them grow right through the snow. Um, there's a plethora of insects and vertebrates and 24 hour light and this undisturbed habitat makes it a bird, bird nesting bread basket. It's one of my sketches of a lap long spur. And it's amazing the, on, on the entire coastal plain, I don't think I saw a plant that was above eight inches high. Um, the wind whips off of the Beaufort Sea in such a way, and the winters are so long and harsh that, that things just really can't get tall. Um, so it's a land of detail. The more you look in, the more you see. It's amazing, these wildflowers were just starting to pop out as I was there, and insects would come and sit in the wildflowers, which would be facing the sun. So it'd be like little solar collectors, and the flies and bugs would sit in there and warm up in their mornings before they took off to do their thing, and also ended up pollinating the plants the same way. Like I said, it's a land of detail. If you get on your hands and knees and really look at it, it's the lichens and the mosses and the history. It's just incredible. It grabs you. What I didn't realize when I was heading out on my adventure that I would be joining an elite team of Arctic ninjas. These are my, uh, um, the field team that were gonna take me around to the bird camp and uh, show me about the project that I worked on. And I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, what we're doing is um, Fish and Wildlife Services surveying uh, this certain area that they've, they've done over 20 years, the same spot. Um, to get a baseline of how successful bird nesting is in this area. Um, theoretically, so if there is some sort of development there, they can say, well, it's affecting birds in this way because these are, this is the data we have from the past 20 years to say. Um, so each of those plots, we'd go investigate and look and see how many birds we could find nesting in this certain plot over um, like a four hour period generally. Um, and this means putting on waders and tromping across the tundra and looking for nests. Um, to survey if a nest is successful or not, they have to use a number of different techniques. There's little remote sensors that they put in, GPS units, and there's a lot of tromping through water. The loons, gulls, um, ducks and geese all like to nest on these little spits and islands right next to the tundra ponds. So you have to be very careful as you're walking along because some ponds are deeper than others. And you don't want to dump your waders. You get mocked when you get back to camp if you're all wet. Um, and of course, some birds don't really like to have their nest checked out. Um, but if you're careful and you keep an eye out, you can see, watch bird behavior to see what they're doing and see if you can find out if they're actually a nesting bird or not. Um, this is a little semi-palmated sandpiper. And once we saw a bird, we'd back up a little bit and these birds would wiggle through the grass like a, like a rodent, pretend to be like a little lemming and distract you from their nest. So if we saw that behavior, yep, there's definitely a nest there. Um, other birds were less subtle. These are black-bellied plovers who apparently have fallen and they can't get up. Try and doing the broken wing display. Please don't eat our babies. 
Um, and you can see how cryptically colored the nests are. This is the nest of a pectoral sandpiper. Um, they were extremely hard to find. You really had to wait and see the parent sit back on the nest, mark that location, and then go over there and pick it out. Um, I was very fortunate that they let the artist actually do a little bit of science. Here I am uh, testing an egg to see how far along it is. As the eggs develop, they get oxygen underneath the shells and they float a little bit. So you can dip them in water and see. Um, and we'd be testing eggs from anywhere from a small sandpiper egg to a tundra goose egg, which is uh, a tundra swan, sorry, which is quite a, quite a clunker. Um, the other thing we did was set camera um, traps along some, pointing at some of the nests to see if they were predated, what happened, or if they were successful to see the chicks leave the nest. Um, they didn't do it on every nest, but some of them. I thought it was interesting that they lag bolt this thing right into the permafrost. But uh, I was fortunate enough that they let me use some of uh, 2018's um, camera pics I can show you what it's like for a nesting bird on the tundra. Um, just be aware that these pictures are all pointed at a bird nest of some sort. And last but not least, it's bad enough the Arctic fox has to eat the egg out of the nest, but what is it doing in the nest ball? Oh, what a dick. Arctic foxes are, are not cool. So life on the tundra and uh, could be foggy and rainy. It could be freezing. Uh, we had a couple days that were 60 and sunny, um, but we were all very happy that that weather port was there after a full day of, of research. Um, had a little heating unit in it and um, it was where the kitchen was and definitely a good spot. Um, we ended up eating a lot of canned food, but every once in a while, someone would bring home a better dinner. A little Arctic grayling. And our tents were all arranged around a circle with a uh, solar-powered electric bear fence on it. You can see my tent, which is the black and yellow one in the foreground, is right close to the bear fence. I'm guessing I was probably the most expendable member of the team. I'm not sure about that. but. Um, and this was my view from the tent as I woke up in the morning and put my extra tufts on. Um, the first morning I woke up, I looked out that vestibule and saw a tundra swan swimming down the river, which is a life bird I'd never seen before. And there were bugs, but not many mosquitoes, surprisingly enough. Although the weather was warm and we kept waiting for things to kick in, there was not a, a big influx of mosquitoes while I was there at the at the camp, which I was pretty, pretty happy about. I had all the mosquito gear and everything, but didn't actually have to use it. Um, but I did get a chance to do a lot of sketching. This is me looking at a pair of tundra swans. Not the easiest bird to sketch. I hadn't really inspected them very closely when I started sketching. Um, they were on the side of a river and they hopped out and were preening. And trying to draw a pruning tundra swan, it's like trying to draw a bowling ball with a python attached to it. Their necks were going every which way. But regardless, here's, uh, here's my little um, video of sketching on the tundra. You know, it's buggy, it's cold, you gotta move fast, you can't screw around. Tundra swans. There was no uh, lack of inspiration anywhere we looked. These beautiful ruddy turned stones were nesting near the camp, so they got a they got a sketch. And there's our black bellied plover underneath. Um, what I ended up doing was a lot of what I called field sketching or nature journaling. As I'd carry a book um, along with the expeditions we went on with a small collection of drawing stuff and watercolors, and I'd whip out, whip out sketches as I could without disturbing the birds and where I couldn't, I took photographs and then would come back to camp and project those photographs onto my iPad and sketch from those. Um, so it was a combination of, of, of drawing. Um, I want to introduce you to some of the birds that live on the tundra and the Canning River Delta. These are Pacific loons. Um, 
the cacophony of bird noise along the um, Arctic plain was really surprising and, and pretty awesome to tell you the truth. You know, all these birds are breeding at the same time. They're trying to get it in. They're trying to find a mate. So they're all making noises and the loon noises were especially distinctive and cool. Red throated loon, another species of loon that's beautiful. Um, you can see that nice rusty red throat. Loons pretty consistently nested very close to the water's edge. So we would be looking for loon nests as we walked along the edge of the ponds and stuff. Um, there's one of my paintings of a red-throated loon. And there's the first bird nest I actually found all by myself, which was a red-throated loon at nest. I was pretty proud of myself, but really, you know, the nest was wide out in the open right against a pond. So it wasn't that hard to find, but hey, I took it, it was good. And eventually those eggs hatch and you get a little baby loon. Another really funky bird, the king eider, were all over the place and they're just, they're just crazy. The, the female is a very demure kind of camouflage duck and the male looks like something out of a science fiction movie. Um, I put a picture of them just so you could see I wasn't making that drawing up. They actually have this crazy coloring on their bills and their faces, so I'm not sure why and the female completely blends in. Um, we were walking back from a survey and almost stepped on this female and her five eggs um, before she flew up and like, oh, there's one. Um, and those five eggs hatch and eventually the tundra breeds more king eiders. It was pretty um, interesting to me that birds that I'd see in Maine, they kind of gave me, the Fish and Wildlife Service gave me a list of birds that, um, I would likely see and would be interested in having me sketch and draw for a project that I'll talk about at the end of the thing. Um, so the, the, most of those birds I'd seen within 10 minutes of my house, all except one. Um, but the birds look radically different when they're in their breeding plumage versus the not breeding plumage. This is the long tailed duck that we might see along the East Coast and the coast of Maine. Um, winter, they're starting to migrate back up now. And that's what it looks like in Arctic Refuge, completely different looking bird. These are Dunlin, which is another small sandpiper. And that's what a Dunlin looks like in Arctic Refuge. They completely changed their plumage, which was, was fascinating to me. So this little bird, this guy's a pectoral sandpiper. And I call these guys the Arnold Schwarzeneggers of the uh, tundra because they are all pumped up. You can see it's got this big, what's, what's a throat pouch, but looks like a chest um, of dark feathers. And they inflate that and fly around the tundra. So the, they make an incredibly cool noise, which I'll do in a second. But they fly, these birds migrate from South America all the way up to Arctic Refuge. They fly up there, get to the refuge, and immediately have to stake out a place to, to find a mate and to fly around madly looking for, looking for love on the tundra, basically. Um, so they inflate these throat sacs and they fly around and they make this crazy UFO like noise, which was one of my other favorite noises that I heard in the refuge. I will not do any other bird, bird uh, impressions except this one because I couldn't find a good recording of it and I like doing it. It's kind of fun. So this is what they sound like. It's pretty funny. They, they just circle around madly looking for a, a mate, a place to find a, a um, set up a nest and stuff. And it said that almost 75% of the males are unsuccessful in their attempts to, to um, find a nest, uh, to find a female and to breed. But some are. And they lay their eggs. This is a bird that once the males have done their breeding and, and flown around like maniacs, they turn around and head back south and let the females raise the young. And those young are pretty darn cute. Uh, there is not much cuter than a baby sandpiper of any kind. And that's my painting of a pectoral sandpiper. Phalaropes are really interesting birds. Phalaropes are a seagoing shorebird and they spend their entire time far out at sea eating plankton and stuff. 
and they only come to, um, to land to breed in the Arctic tundra. They're funny, they're pretty ubiquitous throughout the tundra ponds and they swim around in these little circles and they spiral and spiral with their feet to kick up invertebrates and things off the bottom of the pond to eat. They had very cryptic nests, they were hard to find. And that's a baby phalarope, cute little devil. This is another one of my favorite birds. This is the buff-breasted sandpiper. So the buff-breasted sandpiper kind of blends in. He's pretty camouflaged, blending into the tundra. Um, looks pretty like a generic sandpiper bird, not too exciting. But when they're getting ready to breathe, they find a little hill called a lek, and they flash their wing up. And the underneath of their wings, although they're brownish on top, the underneath of their wings is like a white, silvery, iridescent feathers that reflect the sun. So as the sun is sort of sinking along the horizon, it never, the sun never goes down when I was there anyways. Um, it's 24 hour daylight, but it sinks low. So you've got low light for quite a while. And they catch this low light on their wings and they wave their wings around and wait for the light to reflect off their wings and hopefully attract a female. Then they'll flit up and fly into the air. Most birds, when they're trying to attract a female, will be calling from a tree or, or up on something high, but none of these birds have, there's no, there's, there's no structures anywhere. So they are flying up in the air and flittering around and trying to make a spectacle of themselves to attract females. Some sketches. And eventually they're successful. This is a female um, buff-breasted sandpiper coming to check out the male's display. And once the females come around, that male arches his wings out, catches the light and does a little dance and he's making a noise and singing and showing them the inside of his wings. But females can be fickle creatures. And sometimes your best display just doesn't work out like you were hoping. And you can be all by myself. I don't know why that reminds me of college. But eventually, some males do find a mate. This is a female breath-breasted sandpiper on her nest. You can see her little eye sticking out from the tundra grass. And a sketch of her eggs and a sketch of the female. I know you're not supposed to have a favorite bird, but you may have guessed from my initial um, painting in this presentation that I do. Um, my favorite bird is the snowy owl, of course, that uh, mystical um, denizen of the Arctic that comes to visit us in the winters and then disappears as soon as it warms up. Um, I was very excited to see snowy owls on the tundra, but Arctic refuge is a land of cycles. And snowy owl presence is dependent on the cycles of lemmings. And it was a very low lemming year this last year on the tundra. So there were actually no snowy owls. Apparently they were all on vacation. This is a snowy owl at the Portland jet port here in Maine. I took that picture too, I'm pretty proud of that one. Um, but although there were no snowy owls on the, on the research area where, um, where I was, there was, signs of them everywhere. Last, uh, in 2018, I guess they had like seven nests of snowy owls in the tundra area. So they were, they were everywhere. So there were pellets and feathers and bones and, and all kinds of leavings of snowy owls. And there were actually, although it was a low lemming year, there were a few lemmings on the tundra. And my friend Sarah was, was lucky enough to grab one for me. Um, and so we got a little close-up view of a Greenland collared lemming. Well, I'll show you this one. You can hear the ambient wind in the background, it's pretty serious. That's our friend, Mr. Greenland collared lemming. It's funny, when, he, when she lets him go, he scampers, 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 stops, and rears up and, <laughs> and, and growls at us and then runs away again. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. It was so hilarious. You know, it's a tough guy lemming. Um, so although there were no snow owls, there were a few, para, um, few predators on the tundra, including this parasitic Jaeger, which is a kind of a, a meat-eating gull, basically. And the Jaegers would fly low across the tundra trying to scare up 
uh, birds off their nests and then eat the eggs. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention our good friend Maxine, who is the uh, long-tailed weasel who lived in our camp um, at the Canning River. She had a den right outside the entrance to the weather port. And you could sit there and drink your tea and watch her run back and forth with a lemming or a vole or something. She, she was constantly moving, bringing food in for, uh, I guess she had, this year she had seven babies in that nest. Um, so she was constantly stuffing stuff in there. We, we, we were thinking if we dug that uh, den up, it would just be a massive ball of dead voles, as far as you can see. But she was great. She came through the tents. She would be in the science tent running over the computers. She was very curious and, and always moving. And then we have our friend, the Arctic fox. I know I disparaged them earlier, but Arctic foxes are actually pretty darn cool animals. Um, there's, there was a den near our study site. They were doing some Arctic fox research um, while I was there. So I was able to go out and, and see the den and see the foxes. And like the bird nest, the fox den had uh, game cams on it. So you can see the parents and the baby foxes. I think there were, I wanna say four kits this year for, for the foxes. Parents constantly bringing them food. And if you are a parent, you know, being a parent is not an easy job. And you can see even more from this video that was taken from one of the game cams that's pointing to the, um, pointing to the entrance to the fox den. If anybody can identify the animal that's digging in the den, probably most of you can, but if you can't, it's a wolverine. And that's the male fox trying desperately to keep that wolverine away from his kids. Wolverine are opportunists that'll eat anything they can get. And I don't know if that one bite on the rump of the wolverine was enough to scare it away, but it ended up that those kids survived and the wolverine didn't actually eat them. Um, and maybe Arctic foxes aren't such dicks after all. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the most iconic animal of, of Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the, the caribou, especially the porcupine caribou herd. As I mentioned, it was a land of 24 hour sun. Um, and if you, if you weren't careful and you were cold as you were getting ready for bed and had that last glass of cup of tea or whatever, you found yourself maybe having to get up at three in the morning and put your gear on and put your rubber boots on then make your way out of your tent, step carefully over that bear fence. You don't want to zap anything and take care of your business and then walk back to camp. Well, one morning I had that exact experience and I was, as I was uh, taking care of my business, I looked over at the next ridge and saw this. That was the first caribou we saw. Um, I was so excited. It was this one and a couple others just below the ridge. Um, I madly had to finish what I was doing. Step carefully back over the bear fence, get into my tent, grab my camera, rush out again, make it back over the bear fence and snap a couple pictures in this awesome light of these beautiful caribou before they trotted off onto the horizon. But I needn't have worried because the next day caribou were starting to roll into camp. Um, this sketch may not look like much, but it's a good capture of the caribou walking through the ponds and it was a, a real quickie done. Um, I just like the light of it, that's all. But they, they started to be everywhere. Um, as we walked to do our, um, to do our survey the next day, there were five or six caribou right across the river. And as we're crossing the river, the caribou are like, what is it? What are these things coming across the river? They couldn't quite figure us out, but eventually they trotted off. And sometimes there was no hard to know what to focus on. There's a caribou and then there's a black bellied plover right in front of them. So there was always tons of life going on. The porcupine caribou herd had over 200,000 animals. They'd migrate 800 miles through the Brooks Range to the coastal plain every year to calf. Um, and the reason they come here is because that Arctic wind 
and this is the last sort of place that some ice shelves hang out. Um, both the Arctic wind and the ice keep the bugs off of them. And it could be mosquitoes, although there were not many mosquitoes this year, but warble and bot flies will both lay their eggs on the caribou's skin and bothers them incredibly. I think the bot flies, the warble flies lay the, the eggs in the nose cavity. Um, so it's really a, an unpleasant situation. Um, also, the mountains for us were about 20 miles away, and both the bears and the wolves den in the mountain areas where there's more structure, it's not all flat. Um, so they, although they do follow the herd around eventually, um, earlier in the season, the caribou were able to, to drop their young here on the coastal plain and have the young be strong enough to run away before, they, um, before the predators make it out for the most part was just incredible. Seeing caribou on the coastal plain brought a whole new sense of life to this place. Flying over, you could see their braided paths worn through centuries through the tundra. Um, and just hearing the clicking of the hooves and seeing them, you know, do their thing was amazing. They would be a herd of several hundred and then you'd turn and then they'd be gone. They could just evaporate as fast as they showed up really magnificent animals. There were several hundred while I was there. Um, a few weeks later, several thousand came into camp. Um, this is one of the big herds um, migrating over the Canning River. And it's all about making babies. Boy, are they cute. And some, some uh, souvenirs you just can't take home with you. I talk about the Arctic as a, as a pristine landscape, but where we were on the western edge of the refuge, um, there were signs of human activity in quite a few places. There were lots of these rusted oil drums from the 1980 survey they did to, to um, test drill a well. Um, to get results on whether there's actually oil in here or not. Um, so these things were still laying around. And Port Thompson, which was a natural gas facility, was visible from the camp. You could see it, it was, it was on the next point out. Um, and I'm sure the folks from the Alaska Wilderness League can talk more eloquently about all the threats to the refuge, but the fact that it's, you know, they passed a, ref, a resolution to drill in the refuge with the 2017 tax bill um, against lots of public opinion and are pushing through even in the midst of the pandemic crisis that we're in now, that's job one for um, some members of the Department of the Interior. Um, it just seems crazy to me. I had the unfortunate uh, experience of flying over Prudhoe Bay on the way home. And you can see what um, the future might hold for this magnificent place. It was just industrial waste as far as the eye could see. And then there's the threat of climate change. Um, it's just a changing landscape. I'm not gonna go into it. I'll get <laughs> I got bum myself out, but uh, you can see the ice melting. Later in the season, there was a warning in the area we were that um, the polar bears were basically wandering the shore looking for food because they had no ice to to wander off on. But as Emily Dickinson says, hope is a thing with feathers, and this is the geography of hope. So I'm going to give you a little hope with one of my. Um, birds that have a very personal connection to. This is a semi-palmated sandpiper, one of the most ubiquitous birds in the tundra. Um, it's not a big bird. It weighs about an ounce. That's about the, the weight of a triple A, double A battery. Um, and it spends four to six weeks in the refuge um, raising its young. Flies up from Central America. Lays eggs. 
believe both parents raise the, the, raise the eggs on this um, species. And the chicks are precocial, which means as soon as they hatch, pretty soon after, they're starting to run around the tundra and do their thing. Um, the parents watch them for a couple of weeks to provide warmth, um, but pretty soon the parents have the urge to migrate back down south, um, and they leave these chicks to fend for themselves. There's the fluffy little guys now. Amazingly, and without parental support, I think a lot of homeschooling parents are, are enjoying this part right now, um, these chicks migrate across two continents to a place they've never seen. They build up to the journey over long hops until they gather at staging areas on the East Coast. Um, the Bay of Fundy is a major one. This is the staging area with chicks at the Bay of Fundy, a quick video that a friend of mine shared with me. So it's pretty amazing that these birds can, can pull this off um, without any supervision from their parents as an innate built-in structure in their brains. Um, and if these birds can figure out how to migrate without any help from the Arctic all the way to South America, we should be able to figure out how to, how to save this place. Um, these birds are special to me because there's a group of them that migrate through the state of Maine. Um, this is a quick video I have of me sketching these birds along the beach of the state of Maine um, and watching them and thinking, well, maybe some of these birds, the birds I saw as little chicks running around in the Arctic. I don't recommend trying to field sketch migrating sandpipers who are moving and eating as fast as they can. But they bring me some hope, you know? As we sequester in our spaces and are slowing down the pace of how we live, and we're able to observe the rhythm, rhythm of nature occurring right outside our windows, one of the easiest patterns to see is the migration of birds. They lighten up our yards or beaches or parks and then move on. Where are they going? What are they doing? When will they return? These birds are bringing stories to people who choose to be curious. Stories about the beaches and shorelines in South America, stories about flying across the Atlantic nonstop, stories of the Arctic tundra and the coastal plain. We've become painfully aware that facts have a limited effect on people's attitudes and behavior, but stories, and the connections they make can change your ideas. And the Arctic Refuge has so many stories to tell. It's one of the last places that we can see the living grandeur of how the world works without the presence of humankind, a world before we became the grand engineers of our environment. It's a place against which we can test our wisdom or lack thereof for what we as a species have done to this earth. Few people will have the opportunity to visit here to see the tundra swans and the sandpipers, the arctic fox and the caribou. But aren't we better off as a culture knowing that this small part of the world has been left to its own devices? It's my heartfelt belief that in the coming years we will need these unspoiled places to come back to for science, for spirituality, for inspiration and for hope. As Samwise Gamgee said, there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. This is a little video, a quick one of the Fish and Wildlife Service did of, of my time on the refuge. So I'll just play in case I miss saying anything.
Okay, so we're really lucky we've got a couple pair of um, a pair of tundra swans hanging out here on the edge that are just close enough that I can kind of see what they're doing. Um, so um, I gotta kind of scope it with my binoculars for a sec, see what they're up to. Ah, that one just spread its wings, so cool. Ah, that's awesome. It's been pretty amazing because I've seen an interesting thing every single day, something new and exciting and wonderful and unexpected, um, all dealing with wildlife and the creatures that live here. The amount of wildlife and the pristine nature of the environment really drew me to this place. Flying through the mountains, first of all, and seeing the incredible expanse of openness once you fly through the mountains and hit the Arctic Plain was just amazing. And it just made my soul feel good. It's wild, it's pre prehistoric. Well, the bird's got a certain like personality to them. It's a little sass, a little bird this. So I, I kind of watched that and then watching them in real life versus just working straight from photographs is where you get that sort of personality and movement and what the bird's doing and it, you, know, you can't really figure out what it's thinking about, but you can get inside its head a little bit. And a lot of this is not necessarily about an awesome finished drawing. It's about the process of looking at something and interpreting it from your brain to your hand. But it's teaching me things about how a swan's put together and how they hold their heads and what their attitudes are a little bit. So that's, that's important in my process to kind of see what they're up to, see their personalities a little bit. The migratory pathways that the birds, certain species of birds use to come up here, um, where they breed and then, then where they fly back down from, sort of connecting the lower 48 with this place through migratory birds, which I think is really important. People they love these birds and they see them in their, you know, as they fly through and then they go away and they don't know where they go and they don't know what they're doing. So this is what they're doing and then to get a cool important place, making babies. So part of my project, um, as I give back to the um, Fish and Wildlife Service, was to design a migratory map of the birds that I experienced on the tundra and show where they go through the U.S. and to connect all the different points of the U.S. Um, to Arctic Refuge and to tell their story. So that's what I'm here doing. And I have to big, big shout out and thanks to uh, my good friends at the Fish and Wildlife Service, including Eliza. Morris, uh, Chris Laddie, Lisa Hupp, and uh, all my wonderful researchers at the, at the camp who put up with my endless questions and carted me around. I was really appreciative. Um, you might, might be wondering, how, how do you get to be the artist in residence in Arctic National Wildlife Refuge? Well, I'll tell you what, three years ago, I found this picture of George Schaller, who was a personal hero of mine for all the wildlife science he's done. Um, if you don't know him, Google him. And I made this, um, photo of my screensaver on my computer. And then I love this great quote he's got, you can do the best science in the world, but unless emotion in, is involved, it's not really relevant. Conservation is based on emotion and it comes from the heart and one should never forget that. So this was my screensaver for three years and a year and a little bit ago, I got an email inviting me to be the artist in residence in Arctic Refuge. And a very quick aside before I finish up, um, Arctic, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, has an Arctic bird festival that they put on last September. And it's got all this great content. If you want to learn more about Arctic birds, it's the place to go. Um, that's one of the links. Um, while I was back in um, Fairbanks promoting the Arctic bird festival, it was my last day um, before I flew back and I was birding in this field and I saw this beautiful bird flying around. Um, and it's a gear falcon. It has jesses on it. It's actually, um, somebody was flying it as a falconer. Um, so this person let me hold this bird on, it happened to be my birthday. 
and there's a rainbow in the background. So it doesn't get much better than that. Find inspiration wherever you can. Um, just a little self-promotion. I have two websites. I have my art website that has all my fine artwork um, and some stories from my trips at mboardman.com. And I also have a t-shirt business called Coyote Graphics. And we produce wildlife t-shirts with my artwork on them at coyotes.com. Um, if you'd like to support me, I'd love that. I've just come up with a um, set of cards for Arctic Refuge of six different images of my paintings that you've seen from the talk. Um, and those are, you can find those at both locations. Um, and the M. Boardman site, it's in the news section. Um, that's it. I'm happy to, to field any questions or. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was absolutely wonderful in between the fluffy fledglings and your artwork and the, you know, hearing so many successful migration stories, I can't think of a better way to kind of encompass um, the general feeling of hope that we try to instill into yes. this program. So and birds are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a number of questions, so stay tuned. I'm going to just toss it very quickly to my colleague, Chris, who's going to share a little bit more about the league, and then we will get yep. into questions and wrap up. So Chris, I will share my screen now. Thanks, Monica and, and Michael. Thank you so much for just for, for being on for for sharing all of those incredible images and your art with us. Um, and thanks to all of you for being on the on this event. I think I saw at most we had about 120 folks on, which is pretty exciting for us. And and that and that's a huge step for us to see all all of you joining us, being a part of this event, and and really showing that you care, um, especially at a time like this. And so. What I'd like to do is just encourage folks to, to continue that engagement and continue taking part in our work. Um, and a couple different ways you can do that is, is donate, become a member, or if you're an active member, uh, contribute some additional resources to the fight so that the Alaska Wilderness League can continue fighting on your behalf day in and day out to protect areas like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, aside from that, you can also engage directly in, in our efforts to take action. Right now, uh, there's a an effort to target banks to make them take a stand against funding any Arctic projects. And we have five of six financial institutions short up five of six major US banks. The outstanding is Bank of America. Um, we're hoping to put pressure on them to make sure that they know that it doesn't make any good sense, whether on their bottom line or for the climate or for any reason to fund any new projects in the Arctic. Um, so take an action, make sure that your voice is heard and sign that petition. The link is, is there and, and we'll make sure to send that as well in, in the follow up. Um, and follow us online. Um, we have a lot of great content um, through ac across our Instagram, Twitter, and, and Facebook pages. Um, maybe not some of the, the the fine art quality that we've seen today, but hopefully some good images to, to sort of keep you passionate. Um, and then we do have um, a, a few other events that are coming up in this series as, as we're rolling out, um, including uh, two of our first uh, members only um, events, which are exclusive to our active contributing members. Um, you know, this Saturday, we're going to be transported to the Prince William Sound, um, thanks to our, our founding board member, Debbie Miller, um, who's going to be also highlighting a trip opportunity that we have um, in 2021. Uh, in that region. Um, following that, we have a, a preview screening of The Wild, which is a, a fantastic new do documentary that's not quite released yet. Um, Michael's been, Michael, the filmmaker's uh, been, or sorry, Mark, the filmmaker's been a, a fantastic partner for us, and we encourage you to, to take a look at that when you have a chance. Um, and then f leading um, um, farther out from that, we have our great friend David Thorson, who's sailed, I think, something like 60,000 miles across the world, um, including through the Arctic Refuge a number of times. He's going to be presenting some of his stories, and, and farther out, um, we'll be taking a trip into the Tongass with our good friend Amy Gulick, um, who's going to be doing a stirring presentation. Um, aside from that, I encourage you to reach out. And um, I think with that, I'll, I'll throw it over to Monica. Thank you so much, Chris. And again, we will make sure that you have the link for our full Geography of Hope series in the follow-up email that you receive. And if you missed any of our earlier programs, to the extent we are able, we are sharing the recordings on that main page as well. So you can always go back and check those out. Okay, Michael, uh, we had a number of great questions come up in the chat and I'm very excited to get into it. So uh, first off, could you talk a little bit about um, how you got into wildlife art and how you have found that the, um, the role of art plays in the conservation efforts? Good question. So I, um, I didn't grow up in Maine. I grew up right outside of New York City in Connecticut. Um, and my parents would take me to the Bronx Zoo or the um, 
Museum of Natural History to see wildlife and see the animals there and I just get completely entranced with them. And then we get National Geographic pretty regularly. So I would be looking at that and I would draw the pictures from National Geographic. Um, and so this is a, something that I've sort of fostered throughout my whole life. Um, I think the role of, of art and conservation is to shine like George Schaller said, shine kind of an emotional light on all these sort of hard facts and science and to make a connection with people. I mean, I think with all the news we're hearing, one thing I forgot to bring up is that, you know, 30% of all bird populations have disappeared in the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and we just get pummeled with bad news and it can almost be like you just want to blank it out. You don't want to hear anymore. Um, but if you get an emotional connection, if you see a bird that you've seen regularly and then and get, get connected to it, um, I think artwork is a great way to bridge that gap. And speaking of birds you see often, how about um, the number of birds you got to add to your life list on this trip? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I've seen yet. laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I didn't count them. It was... <laughs> I want to say 20 or 30 for the whole trip to Alaska. There was a, there was a lot of a lot of birds that I'd never seen before, but a lot of the birds like I said, a lot of the birds that I did see regularly were birds that I've seen 10 miles from my house or even our a few of them in our backyard. So, it was pretty neat. That's yeah, that's a pretty um solid dichotomy. So, knowing that you are the artist in residence and not the scientist in residence, um, <laughs> but that you did get to spend a lot of time with the scientists and the researchers at the camp. Uh, one question that popped up was, um, if you knew how the scientists helped to assure that touching the eggs during their studying um, didn't impact the parents or any of the nesting. Yes, so you saw that we had rubber gloves on or plastic gloves on when we handled any of the eggs. And it was mostly, it wasn't anything to do with the parents not, um, rejecting the eggs or anything. It was to keep the, our scent off of the nest for the Arctic foxes and other predators mm. who are scent based. So they, they wouldn't tune in on, all right, there's people sent here. I'm gonna go find that, that egg nest. So we were very careful not to handle any of the, any of the eggs um, with bare hands. Gotcha. Um, and then speaking of predators, and I, I did appreciate your reference to the fox. Um, some people did notice that some of the researchers were also carrying rifles. Um, yeah. Was that also a, just a predator safety deterrent as well? Yeah, the, the Canning River Delta is a place where you can have both polar bear and grizzly bears. Um, so every team had to go out with somebody with a rifle. Um, I never saw, I, I had eight hours of online bear training and never saw a bear while I was there in the Arctic. <laughs> Of either species, unfortunately, I really wanted to see a polar bear. I would have been happy to see either bear from a distance, of course, but of course. Um, I'm going to have to go back, apparently. Uh, did you guys have to use bear cans? Yes, everybody had bear spray on their hips. Yep. Essential, essential equipment. Uh, when you, as you transitioned to the caribou arriving and you talked about um, coming in hundreds and thousands, um, yeah. And eggs. for the most part, is the majority of nesting done? Are most of the eggs it, like having hatched or? No, they have part in where they pick their nesting. <laughs> it's funny. It, it's partially where they pick their nesting. Uh, we we didn't find many trampled nests, and it, as as many caribou as there are, I think they're very careful about where they put their feet. Um, I think if there's, you know, the birds may be on their nest flashing to keep the caribou off of the, off of the nest. I'm not 100% sure, but I, I don't think caribou trampling is a major source of nest uh, failure along the tundra. Wonderful. And then finally, um, the last one that had come up in the chat, and again, we did provide some links in the chat. We will do it in the follow-up email, um, knowing in your discussions with some of the scientists and researchers on there, you did mention at the beginning that this was a program that Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing for over 20 years, I believe. Um, what was the general discussion or consensus in terms of what the research has been showing um, for the bird numbers? Um, that's a good question that I don't have a good answer to. Um, I would assume that um, 
generally they're declining, but that's that's probably one. <laughs> I will uh, I will talk to some of the researchers and get back. We didn't. There wasn't. Yeah, we didn't really talk about a, a general trends as far as what was happening. Well, and we will also do our due diligence and research. So I will tell everyone now they have to open their follow up email um, and see. <laughs> the resources that we were able to dig out. I know, I know shorebirds, which were the majority of birds that we were studying on the, on the tundra have, they're one of the most sharply declined populations of birds um, because of habitat loss, because of their wintering areas along beaches in South America and there are places in the Arctic that are endangered, so. Well, with that, um, I would just like to again reiterate what my colleagues have said and thank everyone so much for coming out. Everyone who's a member, activist, supporter, and part of the Alaska Golden League family, uh, we so enjoy putting on these events for you. But in particular, Michael, it was an absolute joy to have you tonight. Um, you really sure. take us to a place for an hour. Um, I was laughing on mute. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough to know if no, my jokes are hitting or not when I'm here on Zoom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they landed here well. Um, right. Between All that right. and your artwork, um, it just really was a, a fantastic presentation. And I know, you know, at least us here on the East Coast, we're starting to see a lot of the migrating birds come through. And I'm just going to look at them with a different lens after tonight um, and think about where they've been and where they're going and, and what we can do to assure um, that they're going to keep migrating through in the future. So with that, I will say thank you. Um, everyone have a good evening and I hope to see many of you on Saturday when we get to go to Prince William Sound. Got it. That's funny. Thank Just one more, one more quick thing. Um, yes. I do some bird re bird rescue for uh, a local rehab place for birds, and I have to go out. I got a call while I was doing the talk that there's a baby barred owl on the ground that I have to go check. So okay. <laughs> check my Instagram to see what the <laughs> what the deal is. With there that. you go. The story of the bard. Yeah. <laughs> well, Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you, so you everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>